We'll talk about how scheduling actually works in Linux. I mentioned at the end of last class, we started to talk about the scheduler it has separate kinds of processes. It has normal user processes and real-time user processes that are scheduled differently. And then for the kernel level processes, those are non-preemptible. We looked at some of the code in the scheduler. The way the 2002 Linux scheduler is doing scheduling is going through the list of all tasks that are ready to run and computing a goodness function. And that function is computing some number between negative 1,000 and plus 1,000 that is meant to measure how desirable it is to let this process run next. It has the task as a parameter. The other two parameters are which CPU we're scheduling in and the current memory segment. And the reason those are parameters is to try to reduce the switching costs. If a process has run recently on that CPU or is in the same memory space, Maybe you don't have to flush the whole TLB. Maybe there are entries in the TLB that are still useful. So in order to reduce those penalties, it's somewhat desirable to run the process on the same CPU and if there's a process that's using the same memory space. It's computing this function. So it's looking at the policy. If it's not a other policy, which means it is a real time, it's adding 1,000. That's giving those real time tasks a lot of bonus. You can see they're using the same uh, go to fail strategy that the Apple code uses, instead of just returning, going to some label which does the returning. I find this kind of programming really annoying, but some people are taught that you're only supposed to have one exit from a function and end up throwing in go-tos like this rather than having just a return here, which would make more sense. Why do especially C programmers get in the habit of using go-tos instead of returns? If you remember the go-to fail code in SSL, what, what was happening after the fail label? Where did this myth that you should only have one exit come from? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so that, that was the problem there. And maybe if they were both returns, it wouldn't have, you could have still had the same problem. But why did they use a, a go to and a label instead of just returning? Why is this habit well established in, in especially C programs? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the reason that people are taught this and get in the habit of having one exit point is you've usually got to do a bunch of freeze at the end. Part of what you're doing before you're returning is giving up resources that you claim somewhere in that code. So to try to do that all in one place, instead of just returning, they have some exit point that does a lot of cleanup. In this case, there's no cleanup to do, so it just returns. It just makes the code harder to read as far as I'm concerned. And then we're doing other things. There's a penalty if you're changing CPU or changing memory segment. Otherwise, you're calculating the goodness value based on how much you need to finish this. There's some notion of how many clock ticks you have left, and there's some way to compute this function. Whether this is a good measure of goodness or not is certainly arbitrary. This is the whole goodness function from version 2.5. The way the scheduler is picking which process to run was looking at this goodness value, finding the one that has the highest goodness value, and scheduling that to run on the CPU. What's the running time of the scheduler? Oh, I do have a hint. Good. So I guess only a couple of you have read my theoretical computer science book, but maybe the hint still helps. Yes. Which process do we have to compute the goodness function for? Every process. The whole point of it is we're checking every process, at least every process that's ready to run, figuring out what its goodness value is and picking the best one. So what's the running time? Yes. Yeah. The running time is linear in the number, number of processes. It's theta n, where n is the number of processes. That's what it was actually called. They called it the big O n scheduler. Really should have been the theta n scheduler, but big O n is still correct. And it's so popular, it has its own Facebook page that has three likes. It's more popular than me, at least. Apparently, it was automatically generated based on interest of Facebook users. I didn't know Facebook was crawling Wikipedia to generate new Facebook pages, but apparently they are. So the big O and scheduler was fairly popular, or at least it was the standard Linux scheduler until 2002. Then it was replaced with a new scheduler. So this was Linux 2.6. The strategy that Linux 2.6 had for scheduling was to have 140 different queues. There's a queue for each priority level. So we had priorities between 0 and 139. Priority level 0 is the highest. Higher numbers mean lower priority. And 0 to 99 meant you were real time, 100, 139 were normal. What the scheduler would do is look for the queue that has a ready process. So there would be a bit vector that keeps track of 
whether or not a queue has any processes ready, meaning they're waiting to use the CPU. And the scheduler would just pick the first process from the highest priority queue and give it some amount of time. And where it would have a little flexibility is the time it could give it could vary. So it doesn't necessarily give the same time quantum to every process. It can vary that time based on the priority of that process that's running. So if there are no high priority process, none of these real-time processes are ready to run, it's going to give a little time slice to some lower priority process, but it's only going to be a short time slice, so it will get a chance to schedule a real-time process if one needs the CPU. If there's a real-time process that's ready to run, it might get a longer time slice. Here's what that looks like in the actual code. This is the data structure. So we've got a run queue. We've got 140 of these queues. The queue is keeping track of the list of processes at that priority level. We've got an unsigned long bitmap, vector 5. So why is that size 5? Why do we, we need 5 unsigned longs there? How many bits do we need? Yes. Yeah. And to get 140 bits, 32 times 5 is 150 something. 32 times 4 is too small. And that's the bit vector, where if the bit is 1, it means there's something in the queue with that priority that's ready to run. So what is the running time of the Linux 2.6 scheduler? Yes. OK, good. Yeah, so this is constant running time. And you've jumped the gun in saying what it should be called is the big O1 scheduler. And it's constant running time because, well, there's a fixed number of queues. There's 140 queues. And all we've got to do is look in that bitmap to find which queue to look at. That's going to be a constant time operation to find the first one bit in a bitmap that has 140 bits in it. And then we just pick the first one off that queue. So that's also constant time. Linux 2.6.23 replaced that. And the new scheduler was called the Modular Scheduler Core and Completely Fair Scheduler. A much better marketing name than Big O N or Big O 1. The way this scheduler worked is what they called the Rotating Staircase Deadline Scheduler. What this is is actually the same thing that we talked about last class. It's stride scheduling. Right? This is why it's the staircase. We can think of this like stride scheduling. You get your time slices as that staircase goes up. This was the stride scheduling that hopefully you remember from last class. So what is the running time? Maybe we should look at a little more code first. The code's more complicated than the simple stride scheduling code. So there's a run queue, which has two queues in it. So the CFS is the completely fair scheduler queue. There's a separate queue for the real time. And what's in this CFS run queue is a queue pointers to these scheduling entities, so the, the things that we can schedule. And there's information kept about them. The important thing we need to understand is how things get on that queue and how we select the next task to run. This is the code for enqueuing. So this is adding some new scheduling entity to the queue. What do we think the running time of this code is? So we're storing the queue in an RB tree. So that's binary tree, but kept balanced. The RB is the red-black way of keeping it balanced, which basically is going to be looking down that tree, finding the place where this entity belongs. And an entity before is doing some comparison to figure out whether this scheduling entity, which we can think of as the process the task to run with some extra data about it, belongs before this one or after that one. So what's the running time of this? So how many times do we think we're going to have to go through that loop? Yeah. So this is a tree. If it's well balanced, it should be scaling. You know, the depth of the tree should be a log of the number of entries in the tree. And the number, of the, the number of entries is the number of processes that need to be scheduled. This should be log n. That's what stride scheduling is doing. This is exactly doing stride scheduling. We're keeping things in a queue. It's more complicated. And as a sense of how complicated it is, this file that has the scheduler has about 7,000 lines in it. So it's doing lots of things to try to make better decisions than just using a simple measure of stride. It's trying to do things to use multiple CPUs well, to use the memory management well, to keep track of how much each process is getting to try to make it more fair. So fair was a, a big selling point of this. And stride scheduling gives you fairness until things get more complicated, and then you need to do more. So that's why it's 7,000 lines long. And we said the running time is going to be big O log n, where n is the number of processes that need to be scheduled. They didn't call it that because of marketing. Do we care about all this? So I'm talking about these schedulers, and the real reason I'm asking you to think about the running time of the scheduler is more to see that you're understanding how the scheduling algorithm works 
then that really matters. So does it matter that, you know, this sounds like it's worse than constant time, and we have a question on Stack Overflow asking, you know, why would you would ever move from something that's constant time to something that is log n time? Is this the thing we most care about for our schedulers? Yes. Okay, good. It's not the case that if the asymptotic running time is worse, that the actual running time is worse for some particular input. In this case, n is a pretty small number. n is probably less than 32,000, probably orders of a few thousand, maybe. So log of n is much less than 20. It's probably around 10. So that's a really small number. We're not too worried about the scaling caused by the log of n factor. What's more important to the runtime of the scheduling algorithm? Could be the case that the big O1 scheduler takes longer to run. Could be the case that the, the completely fair scheduler, which has running time log n, takes longer to run. What matters about the scheduler? Is that the most important thing? Yes. Good. Yeah. So the whole point of the scheduler is to use our resources well. And that means using the resources well and making good decisions that give whoever owns the machine what they want out of it. The time it takes to run the scheduler is in some sense, well, that's a waste. You're not getting any productive work done when the scheduler is running. So you don't want the scheduler to take a huge amount of time to run. But if you can run the scheduler for an extra few microseconds and it makes a better decision, well, that's probably worthwhile. The actual running time of the schedulers is not that important. What are the resources the scheduler should be making best use of? What are the things that should guide those decisions? The processor? OK, good. So it is scheduling the processor. We want to make good use of the CPU. Is it the best thing to keep the CPU busy all the time? Yeah, did you have another? Good. What's the other resource? OK, making good use of memory. Yeah, and we saw in the code that we looked at for the, the goodness function that if something was in the same memory segment, it gave it a bit of an advantage. That's going to make better use of memory, ultimately use the resource of the machine more efficiently. Are there any other resources we care about in scheduling? Is it, is it doing a good job if it's keeping the CPUs busy all the time? Is that what we want? Yeah, so energy is a big resource. In some sense, that's the resource the schedule is trying to maximize the use of. Because everything else is becoming really cheap. If your problem is not having enough CPU power, well, you can buy more processors and more cores, and they could put more processors and more cores and chips really cheaply. It costs a few dollars to have another core in your chip. The reason you don't put tons of cores and CPUs is because they waste energy, and they aren't used that often in everyday computing. If our key resource is energy, how does that affect how we want our scheduler to make decisions? So we need to understand a little more about how processors use energy. So this is what happens. I think this is an Intel processor. All modern processors can go into different states. And they can go into the idle state, where you don't shut down your machine. You're not completely stopping doing anything but the processor is going into a mode where it's using very little energy. Your processor is going in an idle state all the time. This isn't just happening when you sleep your machine. This is happening all the time within every millisecond, unless you're running some real compute intensive process, your CPU is going into idle frequently. It has at least one other mode when it's actually doing something. Most processors now have multiple modes. You can give them more power and they can do more work. The scheduler is responsible for making decisions that can affect whether the CPU is using more power or, in the best case, using very little power at all because it's idle. Of course, if we actually want to get something done, we don't want our CPU idle all the time. People are starting to think about these kinds of issues. And the scheduler for the Mac OS X Mavericks does some very clever things to try to save power. So this is what a typical millisecond looks like. It's a very small snapshot of time. Your processor is doing work in those red slices. They're spread out over the millisecond where some timer went off, some event happened, some program does a little bit of work. This is mostly all these background programs have timers that are making them do work. But most of the time, you're idle. The idle time, you're saving power. What happens when you actually go into idle time, it's not an instant switch between these two power modes. To get to idle, you've got to power down all these things, all the things in your processor that are using power. You're wasting some power every time you transition between idle and working. Here's what this looks like for real. You're not wasting no power when you're idle. You're wasting some power. Taking time to go to idle mode, so every time you have to ramp up, this is waste. 
if you want to use your energy more efficiently, well, this is not going to affect processor utilization or anything else, but it's going to save you energy if you can move all those things together. So instead of having lots of little idle gaps, you have one big one. This is what you want to do. This is all, remember, in one millisecond. A user's not going to know the difference whether their event that was supposed to happen over here in the first tenth of that millisecond now happens in the middle of it. We're moving things around. That's fine. We're going to save a lot of power by doing this because we don't have all those ramp ups. We just have one ramp up. How do we change our scheduler to make this happen? Would it make sense if, if on each of these places the scheduler runs and decides, oh, I'm going to wait. If there's not enough things to do, I'll wait until the next trigger. Is that going to solve the problem? Yes. Good. Yeah. So what we need to do, it's not good enough to have the scheduler say, so these are all triggered by timers. Each time a timer happens, well, maybe then the scheduler could say, well, let's not do that work. But the scheduler doesn't run like magic. You've got to get the processor running to run the scheduler. So it's not going to help us if we still have to run the scheduler each time a timer goes off. If the timers are all spread out, what we need to do is move the timers around. If you came up with that on your own, that's, that's brilliant. If you've seen that OSX already does this, that's good that you've seen that. It does what it's called timer coalescing. You've got all these different programs, and they're setting timers, and they need to go off at some particular time. But the reality is they're not that precise. The fact that a timer is going to go off within a millisecond is probably not noticeable to any user and not noticeable to the program in any meaningful way. What the OS does is schedule the timers to all go off at the same time. When those timers go off, you wake up the processor, you run the code that each of those programs needs to do, and the scheduler can schedule all of those, and then you go back to idle, and you maximize the work that you do each time you wake up, and you maximize the idle time. This is a very clever thing that if you were thinking about the only point of the scheduler is maximizing usage of resources like the CPU and memory, you wouldn't come up with something like this. The right mentality is to think about most of what we need to do with computer systems is actually trying to minimize the total cost of using them. And most of that cost today is not in silicon or processor. It's the cost of the energy that you need to run it. To recap OS schedulers, that's our real goal. Right? We want to use resources well. The low cost of the scheduler is, unless your scheduler is really doing something very expensive, that probably is fairly insignificant. Deciding which process to run, eliminating the unnecessary switching, saving energy, those are the resources that you can really save. And it's worth making your scheduler a little more complicated to save those resources. Once you're using resources well, then you're trying to give the owner of the machine or whoever the resource is serving the best experience that you can. And that depends on figuring out what it means to give a good experience. That's where when we talked about priorities, it's not necessarily giving the highest priority task always the opportunity to run as much as it wants because we don't want to starve other tasks. Figuring out the right decision there really depends on what matters. What's your metric? What's your measure of being successful?